Hi everyone, so welcome to the first day of our energy conference. This first webinar will be covering the consumer journey on the road to clean energy. So firstly, I'm just going to go over some house rules that we have. So please try and remain on mute when you're not speaking, just so that everyone can hear our panellists. And if you do have any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, so the chat should be enabled for everyone now. And so we do have closed captioning and live transcriptions during the meeting. So there should be a button at the bottom of your screen that says interpretation, and it should have English, French, and Spanish. So you can just choose your speaking language. And if anyone has any problems with that, if you just pop it in the chat and we will help. Um, so we also have captions. So the show captions button is also at the bottom. So you just click show captions and then it's marked with a red square in the picture below and choose your speaking language. And now I'm going to pass over to Helena, who's going to go over our speakers for today. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was a really uh, clear overview and a great start. So we can welcome uh, all of those uh, speaking in English, French and Spanish today. Um, and uh, other languages as well using the closed caption. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. My name is Helena. I'm the Director General of Consumers International, and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this first in a series during the week of the uh, Clean Energy Conference held by Consumers International. Let me explain a little bit why we're doing this. First, as I'm sure you know, on March 15th this week, it is World Consumer Rights Day. Uh, that is a day when around the world, consumer advocates raise global awareness about uh, the importance of consumer rights and needs and, of course, responsibilities. Um, it was about over 30 years ago that Consumers International was asked to coordinate that day. Um, we ask our members every year what they see as the most important trends. Our members are 200 consumer organizations in 100 countries around the world. Over the past years, they have said top issues uh, range between antibiotics off the menu, looking at our food systems, digital finance, tackling plastic pollution, uh, and many more issues that, though we live in a fragile and sometimes divided world, unite us all as consumers. Uh, these are global issues that we all have to confront. For this year, uh, our members gave us very strong feedback that consumers in the energy transition was a critical priority, whether consumer organizations were dealing with daily blackouts, whether they're supporting consumers with affordable energy, whether they're responding to questions about how do I become more sustainable? And so we felt this was a very relevant topic. Throughout the course of the week, uh, we are platforming and supporting any consumer advocate or consumer organization that wishes to focus in on consumer rights at the core and on consumers in the energy transition. Typically, the energy transition can be approached in, dare I say it, a more technocratic, top-down way, maybe. The key question is how do you and I, how do consumers, how do we as just people in the marketplace be part of this in a way that makes sense? How do we shape the energy transition with and for consumers? And how do we do it in a way that's fast, fair, and accountable? Because we know that if we leave this too long, we will be the ones who pay more. Uh, I'm thrilled today in this first session to welcome a fantastic group of leaders. I'm actually going to introduce them one at a time as I ask them to, to talk about the issue. I hope you've been able to capture um, just a little bit of their, their role. You'll see that there's a lot more um, that we'll delve into in terms of their expertise. And they're drawn from across business, from across government, experts, consumer organizations, truly in a way that brings different perspectives together. Um, thank you very much indeed. And I'm thrilled as we see participants from around the world and consumer organizations from, I think, looking at this every single continent. Fantastic to see you. Please don't hesitate to put your questions in and tell us your experience as well. 
I'm going to come to a consumer organization representative first. I'm going to come to Quinta. So if we could bring down the slides, I think I'm doing this right. Um, Quinta, I am really excited by, frankly, your uh, resume. Um, and I'm really excited to hear what you think about the theory of change here, to be honest. You started out, didn't really start out, but you have a PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering from Georgia Tech. You moved from there to business, global business. You were a fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science at the US Department of Energy. Um, you founded your own organization, Energy Research Consulting, to help accelerate ventures in Africa on this topic. And now you are heading sustainability policy at Consumer Reports, which is one of the largest and oldest consumer organizations in the world. I would love to hear from you first, kick us off. Why consumers in the energy transition? What's your view on the theory of change here? What are you seeing consumers experience? And we know not one size fits all, but can you share with us and center us and start us out with consumer rights and needs? Over to you. Thank you, Helena. That was such a kind introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's really good to be here with you. As Helena said, I lead the sustainability policy work at Consumer Reports, and that means we advocate for sustainability policies that drive marketplace change to benefit consumers and to advance equitable outcomes. Within transportation, our focus is on reducing both air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions and ensuring that the transition to clean transportation is equitable. You've heard me say the word equity quite a few times now. Equity is an important thread running through our work, primarily because air pollution impacts overburdened communities the most, since they're often located near, located near transportation corridors. Climate disasters as well impact overburdened communities more because financial recovery is a bigger hurdle for them. And finally, I think it's well known now that overburdened communities spend a higher percentage of their income on fuel and energy costs. Currently, the best way to reduce emissions from transportation is by using zero emissions vehicles, such as electric vehicles or EVs, as we call them for short, because EVs have no tailpipe emissions. Understanding that transitioning to majority EVs will take some time, we have two additional programs to help with the transition phase. First, at Consumer Reports, we're pushing for more stringent fuel economy standards to increase gas mileage and reduce emissions from internal combustion engine vehicles. And we are pushing for low carbon fuel standards, which provide consumers with more options for lower carbon dioxide emitting fuels. For today, I'll focus on our EV work. To begin, why are EVs good for consumers? We've already established that EVs have zero tailpipe emissions. But it's also good to know that Consumer Reports analysis shows that EVs save 60% on fueling costs and 50% on maintenance costs when compared with comparable ICE vehicles, that's internal combustion engine vehicles. So EVs are cheaper to own, even when they cost more to buy upfront. The other question we often get asked is, do consumers even want these vehicles? And the answer is a resounding yes. Our 2022 survey on Americans' perceptions and awareness of EVs showed that 71% of Americans expressed some level of interest in buying or leasing an EV. Within that 71%, we found 14% of Americans would definitely buy or lease an EV today. That 14% is up from just 4% who said the same thing in a 2020 survey. And vehicle sales data matches these survey findings. Um, over the last few years, internal combustion engine vehicle sales in the US have steadily declined, while EV sales have increased rapidly. And in fact, our car buying survey from last year shows that 30% of licensed drivers who are looking to buy or lease a new vehicle are not even considering a conventional non-hybrid vehicle. When we asked Americans why they, were, they would consider an EV, the most common answers were saving money on fuel, lower lifetime costs, and lower maintenance costs. So it all ties back to money. What's holding consumers back from adopting EVs faster though? So we asked about uh, barriers and the top concerns include charging infrastructure and costs involved with buying, owning, and maintaining an EV. So we are working to address these barriers in several ways. We conduct analyses and studies to help consumers and lawmakers understand the cost savings and other benefits of EV ownership. One example is our total cost of ownership report, which compares the cost of buying, owning, and maintaining an EV 
versus an internal combustion engine vehicle. We are weighing in on EV-related policies, such as the Environmental Protection Agency's light duty vehicle greenhouse gas rules, which regulate tailpipe emissions from passenger vehicles. Another notable policy example is California's recently passed Advanced Clean Cars 2 rule, which mandates that all passenger vehicles sold in California by 2035 will be zero emissions or plug-in hybrid. Consumer reports weighed in to ensure that the rule contained consumer protections in the form of battery warranty and durability. This rule ensures clean vehicle options for consumers in that state. Last August, the Inflation Reduction Act was signed into law. Among other things, it provides incentives to bring down purchase costs for both new and used EVs. Again, Consumer Reports is weighing in on how the incentives are rolled out to ensure that there's minimal red tape, which would discourage consumers from using these incentives. We have also weighed in on the bipartisan infrastructure law, which provides $7.5 billion to expand public EV charging infrastructure throughout the country, which should address one of those barriers that consumers said is preventing them from adopting EVs. Among other things, we're asking for the new infrastructure to be reliable, but also present in every community. Finally, we are informing consumers about their EV options through our EV Plus Hub, which features information and buying tools on EVs and hybrids. For instance, we have an incentives finder to help consumers find incentives to off offset purchase costs for EVs. In addition, our Green Choice badge for vehicles is awarded to the top 20% of vehicles on the market, which have the lowest emissions. So that's a summary of our efforts to ensure consumers have clean vehicle options and that no community is left behind as we transition to cleaner transportation. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. And Quinter, if I can come back to you, you focused in on mobility and how we travel as one of the many ways in which we use energy. If I can just come back to you and say, do you think some of those interventions and some of the same points apply to other areas of energy efficiency and the energy transition? Great question. And my answer would be yes. Um, certainly, if we're going to reduce emissions, we want to be more efficient. So as in mobility, um, we'll see the same thing hap um, happening and applying in the home, for instance. So we want to make sure that air quality in the home is good. We want to make sure that people are spending less on energy. So energy efficiency addresses both of those things. So either electrification or just making appliances in the home more energy efficient. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you for raising the sort of systemic nature of this, right? Consumer organizations, it's not just about campaigning. There's a way in which we need to intervene in the system as a whole uh, to make it work. I'd love to now move to Asma. Asma Ruabia is, Ruabia, excuse me, is the global focal point uh, for the youth constituency for SDG 7. SDG 7 is, of course, the sustainable development goal related to energy, making sure that we have access to uh, renewable energy, affordable, uh, uh, clean energy for everyone. Um, and Asma is also the regional manager for uh, Girl Up at the UN Foundation uh, for the MENA region. Asma, in your role, looking across the world now and talking and trying to engage uh, people under the age of 30 who represent, I think it's half of the global population now and will be directly impacted by all of this and are directly impacted. How would you, uh, how, how are we um, approaching this? What can we do to drive progress faster? And are you seeing the younger consumer, again, not one size fits all, but are there certain things you can help us learn about how the younger consumer might perceive this? Thank you. Thank you so much, Helena. First, thank you and Consumer International for the kind invitation and this great initiative that uh, brings all these amazing experts from different backgrounds and, of course, making sure that the voice of youth is heard uh, at the energy space and also as young consumers. Um, for me, like from uh, my also like academic experience, because I, uh, I had my major in marketing and then my master's in innovation management, uh, we were uh, looking into how to engage youth into the innovation process, whether in marketing or other uh, or other issues. And for me, like now, my focus uh, is youth de leadership development and also the uh, the energy space. 
and from this uh, experience, I believe um, user innovation is really crucial, whether uh, we're talking about business and um, marketing in general, or if we're talking about energy as well, that we need to put youth at the heart of designing solutions because youth uh, or the young consumers will offer you um, insights and ideas and, and information on what the youth population needs are, what kind of issues they're facing, and also what kind of solutions could be there uh, that they will be adopting, they will be using, and also influencing their parents, their communities uh, to adopt uh, these energy efficiency uh, solutions. And uh, from my experience, we've, we've been like trying to design as users, what kind of solutions would first work for us and then would work for other youth as well in, in whether sit within the same country or different countries uh, across the world. So yeah, user innovation is really crucial and also open innovation, which means we uh, try to think of solutions with different stakeholders, whether the public sector, whether the private sector organizations, that's really crucial because that offers uh, different perspectives. And it is crucial and a must uh, to be honest and to say to engage youth because they, they are the ones like now leading and also will be leading more in the future. So they need to be highly equipped. They need to know about what's happening in the world, what's happening in the energy transition what kind of like ideas are emerging and what kind of solutions we need for uh, for our world to combat climate change and also to to work more effectively uh, for the uh, for the energy transition so yeah we need to always engage them in different dialogues in um, like also knowledge sharing and um, and the re repository of knowledge and also um, having youth having like a seat at the decision-making table that whenever there's a high level meeting that we need to engage uh, youth in these uh, important meetings to, to make sure that their voices are heard. And also for us as young people, when we feel that we are heard and there, uh, there's like someone really actively listening to us and our views are, um, are valued, we, we become more, more motivated to give. And sometimes like youth don't ask for like something back we don't ask for example we do things voluntarily and we uh, really like want to offer our um, our passion our time and our dedication to uh, to create solutions so yeah i believe engaging youth at the early stages uh, and innovating with youth always creating spaces for you to innovate to think with them and to share information and also to formulate policies and decisions with them whether we are in the non-profit or for-profit sectors. Thank you, Asma, and thank you for being with us and all power to you as you uh, do that engagement and push for decision-making. Um, I mean, there's a common sort of view out there that perhaps the younger generation or those under, under 30, if that's truly younger, um, are perhaps more bought in to change. Uh, is that, what do you see? Yeah, so uh, within the UN, like I think the age is still 35, but in general, like 30, I think within, um, yeah. So it's like the definition of youth differs from uh, organization to another, but I would personally say, yes, still 35, uh, that's the person is considered youth, but also there's the youth at heart, those who, uh, who are above 35, but still advocating for youth and pushing for, uh, youth spaces and youth voices, even myself, I was thinking, oh, what if like when I get to 30 or like 35 or uh, older than that, am I still going to work uh, in like youth spaces? I might not have same opportunities as I have now as a young person, but I will still be an advocate for youth and push uh, for youth engagement, especially when we become uh, parents or uh, grandparents, that's really like you start to feel how important it is to get opportunities at very early stages in life and that it is crucial to, to equip the younger generations, despite that there are a lot of challenges, but still it is important to uh, for us like as young people to believe in ourselves and our potential and also for different stakeholders to always uh, create spaces for youth and hear from them because they really have great and innovative ideas. Oh, well, well, that's a great call to action for the first, uh, for the, the opening section of our 
our first uh, meeting. We are all young at heart and let's stay that way. I'm sure I, I, I can hear that back from participants and speakers. Thank you. Um, Yannick, uh, Yannick Monschauer is an analyst with the International Energy Agency. I'm sure everybody knows that as the, the uh, core uh, organization that drives the analysis and data gathering on uh, the state of the world related to uh, energy and the energy transition. Um, Yannick in particular has been uh, driving, he coordinated the co-custodianship, custodianship, excuse me, not enough coffee, of SDG 7 targets on renewable energy. He's also uh, been the author, I think more recently, of a piece of work specifically on heat pumps, which is of course a particularly important issue and point for uh, consumers as they think about energy efficiency. Yannick, round off this first section of what should we know, where, how do we set, set the scene of the state of play towards SDG 7 and uh, shifting, to a, uh, shifting through the energy transition to something that's affordable, secure uh, and sustainable? Yannick. Yeah, thanks, Helena. And yeah, as I said, uh, I'll focus a little, a little bit more on, on heat pumps. But uh, yeah, to start off, thanks a lot also to Quinta for, for diving into this uh, EV example. I also wanted to mention EVs briefly, but I think you already provided a great overview on, on the policy side there as well. And also thanks to Asmo for uh, providing this young consumer perspective. Uh, as uh, yeah, young consumers today will be very key to drive the, the clean energy transition over the coming decades. Uh, yeah, but let's step back for, for a second and uh, see, uh, or let me add in the, the long-term uh, lens on, on all of this, because I work in the World Energy Outlook team at the IEA, so uh, we, we keep track of policy and uh, technology progress and show what really needs to happen in buildings, but also in transport and in uh, the industry sector to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And consumers are key to make this uh, clean energy transition uh, happen in all these uh, sectors and in some more than others. Uh, so it's, it's been buildings and, and uh, transport uh, more than, than industry, but still I think uh, consumers play a big, big role in, in all of these sectors. Uh, and let me start with where we stand today. So we've already made a lot of progress since uh, the Paris Agreement and we already see or we expect a peak in fossil fuel emissions uh, before 2030. Um, uh, just based on, on the policies that are implemented today. But if we go even further and also take into account the NDCs and uh, net zero pledges that have been made by governments, but also uh, pledges by uh, uh, or commitments by companies in, in aviation and, and shipping, that would bring us down to 1.7 degrees of, of global warming. Uh, but of course, there's a big if to that. So that really means that they have to be implemented. Uh, in full, there have to be the policies, and there has to be the, the consumers uh, behind uh, these um, policies that really make uh, things happen in, in reality. So, yeah, that would get us really close to 1.5 uh, degrees. Uh, and for heat pumps, for example, what, what we need is a tripling of uh, what is installed by 2030. And uh, for that to, to happen, as said, we, we need policies. Uh, and I th it has to be an obvious choice for consumers uh, from a cost perspective, but it also has to be easy enough uh, for consumers. So uh, when we take the heat pumps, the heat pumps, for example, we already have financial incentives in, in over 30 countries today. And in, in a lot of markets, they already make the cheapest options. If you compare the cheapest uh, gas boiler to the, the cheapest uh, heat pump on the market, they make them uh, already cost competitive, uh, competitive uh, in, in, in many markets. And in some cases, you even have additional subsidies uh, for uh, low income households uh, that need additional uh, support because they can afford the upfront cost even less, or you have uh, additional support for high efficiency models uh, and, and some other uh, specifics. So uh, yeah, there, there's already a lot happening that, that's making uh, the technology more competitive, but at the same time, you still have a lot of barriers. So uh, just taking, uh, because on the one hand, you have the upfront costs, but you also have the operating costs. And uh, that's where electricity tariffs and energy taxation uh, are still uh, favoring uh, fossil fuel options in, in some countries. So yeah, that's, that's also something to address, while at the same time, you have uh, non-economic barriers 
uh, restrictions related to installations and uh, anything other that's uh, preventing consumers who are interested in the technology to really uh, adapt it. And so for that to make it uh, happen, uh, it, it really is important that uh, the incentives are strong enough on the financial side, but then also it has to be easy enough for uh, consumers to see the benefits, to compare options uh, in the case of heat pumps to find installers and, and deal with the admin uh, procedures. And Printer provided some great examples for EVs on uh, yeah, how endorsement labels and incentive finders uh, can make it a lot easier for, for consumers. And this is something that we already see for heat pumps as well. So in, in Ireland, uh, just to mention one example, there exists in other countries as well, but you have these uh, so-called one-stop shops that uh, kind of take away the headache for the consumer in throughout this journey. So it's just really uh, helpful. And then uh, you have business models like um, heat as a service that uh, can also reduce the upfront costs and uh, ensure that the, the maintenance is also there for the consumers not to worry about it. So yeah, I think there's, there's really a lot that can um, uh, yeah, make it a lot easier for for consumers. Uh, I won't mention transport in the interest of time, I think, but I think you already provided a great uh, example, and I'm happy to come back to some other examples or TV comes later. Brilliant. So those three speakers have pointed to uh, the fact that the energy transition covers a vast range of sectors, um, from mobility to how you use energy in your home, um, and it's important to think all of the, about all of those aspects. Um, we've heard from Yannick that consumers are key to the energy transition. We've heard from Quinta that consumers want to see the energy transition and affordability is essential. Um, let's move at this point, uh, having set the scene, to hear from a colleague of mine, Ollie Bealby Wright, um, as he and the team have been digging into how do we make sure that the energy, energy transition works with and for consumers. So we'll do a little bit of looking at this and then I'd love some reactions from the panel. What feels uh, particularly priority um, as we look at this issue? Have we missed anything? And uh, as you, anyone who is a participant on chat, do feel free to pose questions or add your own experience. How does your own experience of consumer perspective uh, chime with what we're hearing. Ollie, are you on the call and able to chime yes. in? Thank well, you, Helena. And I'll start talking you all through the white paper that um, we are launching today. Uh, and this was made in knowledge partnership with NL Foundation uh, and in technical partnership with Ace Research, which is a team uh, at the Association for Decentralized Energy. I don't know whether it's just me, um, but I've got an interesting thing on my screen. Uh, so I'll try and bring to life uh, the white paper through words, um, since visuals uh, alone aren't necessary. The kind of starting point for this knowledge partnership was twofold. Firstly, we think that consumers, the choices they make, uh, the practices they adopt, is central uh, to the energy systems change we need to see. But secondly, the energy systems that don't center consumers' needs and rights um, are not going to see this change. It's not just a nice thing to do to make an energy system centered around the rights of consumers, but it's actually key to empowering consumers um, to take action. If I could just unpack that really quickly, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's Sixth Assessment Report last year estimates that up to 70% of future greenhouse gas emissions reduction could come from so-called demand-side changes. And we've heard from Quinta a little bit about what this means from an individual's perspective or an individual consumer in the US, for example. It means upgrading to electric vehicle. It means changing the way you heat, cool, and power your home, the way you get around. And we've heard a little bit from Yannick about what it means from the kind of system perspective. It means mobilizing consumer investment in technologies like heat pumps, but many others to electrify end uses. It means enlisting consumers for greater flexibility, storage in a digitalized energy system. It means decentralization and greater community control, as we'll hear shortly from Luigi at NLX. None of this can happen uh, without consumer action and buy-in. So consumers are a really key actor in the energy system, 
but unlike other energy system actors, um, they are also representing the ultimate purpose of energy systems, which is to meet their needs. So if we go into the next slide, please. As consumer advocates, and many in the audience are consumer advocates, so you will know that we come to this from a consumer rights perspective. And these are the 11 legitimate consumer needs, so-called, as agreed in the UN guidelines for consumer protection, which is uh, well known as the International Benchmark on Consumer Protection. Um, it has been adopted by the UN General Assembly and represents a global consensus of countries and experts on consumer protection. This includes everything from access, the ability to access essential goods and services, which includes energy, to safety in terms of safe products that consumers can use uh, without risk to their health, for example. It includes representation, the freedom to form consumer groups and have their voice heard. Uh, it cl includes redress in the case of things going wrong, um, because there is always risk in a marketplace. Just to sum up, the energy system change we need to see won't happen if we don't look at all of these legitimate needs um, because the greatest market driving force arguably is people's desire to live healthier, cleaner, uh, more affordable lives. If we go into the next slide, please, just to give you a quick overview of the scope of the research we conducted with the Nell Foundation and ACE Research uh, and how we went about looking at this from a global level. So we categorized consumer choice in the energy system into three different categories. The first is clean energy supply, and that can be broken down into grid supplied electricity and the choices made around there. Do you go for a green tariff, for example, into self-generation and solar PV, for example, we'll hear more about that case study and participation in energy communities, for example, which Luigi will talk about. It includes things related to the material artifacts or the the buildings and the appliances and technology around us. So it includes home energy performance, it includes technologies like heat pumps uh, and like electric vehicles. And it includes, um, encompassing all of this, different modes of engaging in energy systems. So prosumption that is producing as well as consuming energy and participation in demand flexibility, which is a theme that we'll be talking about a lot in tomorrow's session. And I encourage you all to sign up for that. Next slide, please. In theory, consumer choice is central, but in practice, it's extremely difficult often for consumers to make these types of choices because of the barriers they face, which are regulatory, infrastructural, technological, knowledge barriers, and so on. To really assess these barriers, you need to think across the whole life cycle of a product, a service, and also a consumer. And if you think about each of those types of choice, they could also be thought of as a interlinked consumer journey so a series of interactions over time that a consumer has with a product or service and that's how we've gone about assessing the barriers in our white paper so from knowledge and awareness are consumers able to understand the opportunities for change and do they trust the information that they receive the availability of safe and affordable solutions are there safe and affordable options on the market for consumers to choose so are they affordable, but also are they backed up by the right products, um, product standards and safety certifications? Implementation, can consumers invest in solutions uh, with ease without undergoing serious risks? Use, so are consumers able to use these systems efficiently, safely and effectively? That's about information, but it's also about a next generation of customer service, which really shows that you cannot just sell a product to consumers and leave it with them. And finally, maintenance, repair and redress. Um, are consumers supported after purchase? Are they able to access adequate maintenance and redress in the case of things going wrong? Next slide, please. So using that as a framework for thinking about this, we looked across 11 countries uh, at the best interventions which can remove barriers and we were looking especially for interventions which use a different type of collaboration between different types of actors whether they're public or private actors uh, especially those that bring in consumers in the design of solutions uh, and consumer advocates in the design of solutions 
And secondly, we're interested in solutions which really focus on that consumer journey and removing barriers either across the journey or at a specific stage. And I'll just give you a snapshot of two of them on the next slide, please. The first is in Rwanda, which is a country where there's um, less than three quarters of the population currently have uh, electricity access, and they aim by 2024 to reach 100%. Um, efficient appliances are a really key part in that since they can reduce demand by up to two thirds for typical energy services. Two of the barriers for efficient refrigeration and air conditioning units in Rwanda are knowledge and awareness. So consumers are not aware of the different differentiation in the marketplace and how they can participate in these new solutions and also availability. One of the key things that we've found across all the case studies is many of these uh, clean appliances and technologies require a lot of upfront consumer investment, and that can be unaffordable for many consumers, especially the most vulnerable. So our call is an initiative from the UN Environment Programme, collaborating with other marketplace stakeholders um, to mitigate both of those barriers, it includes establishing minimum energy performance standards, a labelling scheme that links to that, ensuring information is correct on cooling equipment, community awareness campaigns, and finally, innovative financing that helps to scale adoption through market availability. So for example, on-bill financing mechanisms. And some of the interventions are similar in our Chile case study, which really looks across the consumer journey. Casa Solar is looking at the barriers to uh, grid-connected solar PV on homes' rooftops. One of the, that, again, is the need for upfront consumer investment. Another is the typical lack of trust in the administration and provision of schemes. And thirdly, there's a lack of um, the matching between the system output and what is consumers' actual needs. But what they've done through this program is firstly, include a third party that administrates the scheme to raise trust. There is a bulk purchasing scheme where the government co-finance with a public bank, which can reduce cost of installations by around 20%. And finally, they include a technical evaluation of your actual property and select the appropriate system size. And then the delivery agency provides ongoing support to households throughout and after the process for one year thereafter. So those are two snapshots of really interesting use cases which have transferable learnings and show how using that consumer journey framework can identify barriers and identify solutions. I want to hand back to Helena because we've got two amazing other case studies from Italy and Brazil um, that we're thrilled to be spoken about in the words of those behind them. Ollie, thank you so much and great work. Um, I'm going to come back to you for one question, which is as a result of looking at all of that and the case studies and the situation and laying out a framework to help us all, what do we need to do next? What would the top priorities be? Well, funnily enough, we have a slide on that. I mean, it's Chloe, would you mind going to the next slide? I think the one thing that we really found in the process of the research um, was about collaboration. We're from the consumer world um, and we speak as a world and we speak the same language and it's the language of consumer protection. What we were trying to do with this knowledge partnership with the Nell Foundation is say, well, there's another way of looking at cons consumers or customers, which is saying we need to support and provide solutions to them across their consumer journey. How can we bring those two frameworks together? That's really what we were trying to do with the white paper. And what we are recommending is actually that we scale that sort of collaboration to meet new solutions. And we'll be hearing about this from the other speakers. So we want to align consumer and energy policy for the transition. We want to support market offers and business models that protect and empower consumers by design. And that requires collaboration as well. And then as Yannick's already touched on, we want to scale data intelligence um, because too often the energy transition is seen as purely a supply side issue uh, or just a technical technological issue consumers uh, affordability just transition metrics will be key um, to measuring progress and ensuring that we continue to uh, target our interventions in the right way 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. So let's pick up on these and we're going to reflect on them as we go through. Um, as Ollie pointed out, we've got um, some examples. So these case studies are about saying this can be done. Can we scale up? What does it take to put those in place? I'm thrilled to call on uh, Luigi Canelli. Uh, he is from NLX, which is the innovation uh, part of the company. You can correct me on this. And you're head of product and business development in renewable energy communities. Um, so you have been, really been diving into how do we make this work from a, a range of perspectives, from a, a, a business model view, and have really uh, launched and been involved in the launch of a number of those. Um, I think we're calling on you, and of course, um, as one of our co-conspirators uh, in uh, exploring this over the past couple of months, could you give us an example, perhaps the example we've used from energy uh, from Italy here, um, of how you can make this a reality? What did it take? What did it look like? Where do you think we still need to go? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Elena. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, and mainly because the regulation in Italy is changing, uh, actually, as we speak, in the sense that is uh, February news that the government has decided to send the first draft to the EU for the implementation decree of the of the Red 2 directive. So uh, the Italian government has decided to move from a pilot phase on energy communities to a scale-up phase where uh, they're actually impacting, in my opinion, on the consumer's behavior heavily uh, with the aim of breaking some of the barriers that Oliver was mentioning uh, before. Uh, with, with four, uh, maybe four, four main steps. The first one is simplification. So compared to the other EU countries that uh, implemented the Red 2, the Italian government is moving towards simplification in terms of defining the domain among which the energy will be shared in an energy community, which is a primary substation, but mainly this will be reduced to interactive maps that will be provided to the customer. So uh, this is the first point. The second point uh, is the a palatable incentive scheme that would allow for quick returns for on the investment in uh, renewable energy plants uh, serving energy communities. Third is together with a palatable incentive scheme, there will be also a capital uh, incentive, uh, which will cover up to 40% uh, of, the, of the capex invested. And this will apply for the municipalities that have more than uh, less than 5,000 inhabitants. So this is also to uh, allow for access to clean and reliable electricity for smaller municipalities. Last but not least, and this is, goes back to scalability, is a contingent, a tangible contingent of five gigawatt of incentivized capacity in uh, within 2027. So uh, I think that, uh, so again, this is happening uh, right now. So all the dots are now connected to, to make this real and to make it scalable at the national level, uh, impacting on millions of consumers uh, in the Italian uh, uh, territory. Uh, is this enough? Uh, this is, I think, the, the, the main question. And the, the answer could be yes and no, in the sense there's still something that other players could do to make this real. And in particular, I will mention utilities. So we, we recently interviewed uh, 500 consumers, uh, 500 of our customers, and they still recognize a very important role in the utility uh, within the energy community framework. And uh, the, the main role is to uh, simplify and support the customer in this energy transition. The reason is that, uh, as Oliver was mentioning, there is a lot of technical complexity uh, within an energy community framework. So the role of utility of the utility is, first of all, to simplify this aspect, to manage the bureaucracy for the customer, and to be sure that the customer will be just impacted positively in terms of cost reduction, and also in terms of potential value stacking that it could achieve within an energy community, adding other services such as, for instance, flexibility. So uh, I think these are the main aspects for Italy. Uh, we, are, we are ready 
the Italian government is ready. And I think it's a, it's a rather positive example that could be exported uh, even in other countries, uh, hopefully as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Luigi. And we're going to move to a very different context now with Angelica Martins representing Electrobras. Um, Angelica, thank you so much for joining us. I think you're another person uh, joining us early. Uh, you have worked on uh, for the generation board at Electrobras um, and with uh, them on uh, some of the, the leading power pro projects in Brazil. Um, and you are with us to share a little bit um, about a case study, which is called Light for All, um, where you're working in the Amazon. Can you share why that's an important case study and what you've learned from it and what more you need to do um, to, to make that work for consumers? Angelica. Yes, nice to meet you, everyone. Thank you, Elena. Uh, in 2012, uh, former United Nations Secretary General uh, Ben Ki-moon famously referred to energy as the golden thread connecting economic growth, social equity, and environmental sustainability. This was a recognition of how access to energy is critical for productive activity, and access to clean energy is critical for positive health and climate outcomes. Uh, energy for development and the energy poverty will be central to any pathway to net zero emissions. As Consumers International White Paper, uh, we believe that empowering consumers to adopt clean electricity supplies is linked to the leverage of renewables-based energy systems and is also essential to ensure access to sufficient clean energy for people currently lacking ba basic access. Uh, the optimal strategy is to achieve this uh, through supply of clean electricity and shift consumers' energy practice to electricity, which in turn depends on the use of electric appliances and technologies. In this context, we would like to present briefly Brazil's issues, challenges, and opportunities regarding Amazon isolate systems. Uh, Amazon is an incredible ecosystem with an amazing amount of biodiversity, cultures, languages, people, and is an essential part of the mitigation in combating climate change. All of us are responsible for Amazon development and we need of the involvement of the local communities in order to get success in our actions in the region. In terms of energy, uh, there is a contract between Amazon isolate systems and national interconnect system. In Brazil, we have a region that is supplied by clean and renewable resources with a national interconnect systems and low emission intensity. And this reality is in contrast with Amazon isolate systems that electric matrix is based in diesel generation. So isolate systems are electric power distribution public utility systems that in their normal configuration are not in electrically connected to the national interconnect system for technical or economical, economical reasons. Uh, although, uh, although the legal Amazon has its largest representation for isolate systems, it also owns four of the five largest hydroelectric plants in Brazil. So that is, it generates more than 25% of the country's electricity in 2020. In this way, uh, it contributes to the supply of all Brazil through the national interconnect in the connect systems, which connect power plants and consumers in the country. Despite its relevance in the national electricity scenario, three uh, million inhabitants of the Amazon are disconnected from the national interconnect system, leaving the isolated systems. And nowadays in Brazil, there are 212 electrical systems in location that are not connected to the National Interconnect System with more than 90% of this capacity based on diesel generation. Uh, because of the complex logistics and difficult access of isolated systems, diesel generation cost is six times high, higher than generation costs of the rest of Brazil. Per capita consumption and population density discrepancy highlight this context and it shows social and economic development difference in Brazil. So the, the operation of isolated systems is expensive and shared by all consumers in the country 
through the electricity bill. And in 2022, the cost was estimated at more than 10, uh, 10 billion, uh, billion Brazilian reais. Uh, there is a, a need to create favorable conditions so that renewable supply initiatives cheaper in the long term for supply to these locations. Uh, such systems are served by, by uh, eight distributors, companies in seven states of the country, and the population serve, served by these uh, systems lives in a low density area, which covers approximately 40% uh, of the country. It should be noted that there was a significant reduction in the number of isolated locations compared to the last annual Brazilian energy research company, EPE, planning cycles. So uh, it's still within the scope of isolated systems, Eletrobras and the National Bank for Economic and Social Development made a voluntary commitment at the United Nations in September 2021, the energy compact, the carbonization of the electric matrix of isolated systems in the Amazon, replacing diesel generation with clean, renewable and accessible energy. The Energy Compact will cover initiatives for the replacement of diesel oil, which includes opportunities for projects using solar photovoltaic systems, microgrid arrangements, local energy storage devices, such as, as batteries. Energy Pacts are a, me a means of promoting voluntary commitments from all interested parties and collaborating to accelerate the Sustainable Development Goal 7 which address clean and affordable energy in the context, in the context of the 2030 Agenda. Angelica, just in interest of time, um, perhaps if you could skip to the specific uh, changes that you're seeing and perhaps how to scale up faster, um, just because we haven't got, uh, I want to make sure we bring everybody in before the end of the session. Okay, uh, in addition, I'd like to, to highlight the uh, more light for Amazon. Uh, it was the success for to the electric program, Life for All, responsible for increasing access to electricity for 90% of the Brazilian rural population mm -hmm. in the period from 2003 to 2013, and which incorporates primarily consumers located in the area of expansion of the interconnected nations. The More Light for Amazon was created by initiative of the federal government with the aim of promoting access to electricity for the population located in remote regions of the state in the legal Amazon, which do not have access to conventional grid, estimated in 70,000 families. I'd like, to, uh, I don't have uh, time enough, but uh, in December 2022, uh, programs surpassed the mark of 44,000 people benefit in the regions of the legal Amazon with more than 11,000 families. This program and other actions in parallel hope to change the isolated uh, Amazon community reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica. Really appreciate you sharing that specific um, case. Now, I'd like to hear reactions um, and also reactions, not just to the case studies, but to the three proposals we've, we've suggested um, as key recommendations from the report. So um, a global set of a global set of case studies, and then the three recommendations were about how do we bring together consumer and energy policy? How do we support the business models that need to be in place that are perhaps radically different um, and, and quite sometimes quite difficult to put in place? And then third, how do we make sure we track and have the data that looks at this from the people perspective? Um, how this is actually working for people and the level to which they can engage with this system, or in fact, any other uh, reactions to what we've heard. Um, I would love to first come uh, to Teresa uh, de Piedade Moreira. <laughs> she is the head of the Competition and Consumer uh, Policy uh, uh, Division. Uh, and directorate at UNCTAD. She comes to us, of course, and I, I know many in the consumer uh, world will know Teresa extremely well. Uh, she comes with a deep background in consumer and competition law. Uh, she was the consumer De director general in Portugal until 2016 when she moved into her global uh, role at UNCTAD, uh, which is, of course, the holder at the United Nations of the consumer protection guidelines. Um, and uh, Teresa, of course, uh, was a member of the board uh, of the Portuguese Competition Authority as well. So 
Teresa, I'd love to hear your views on number one, the recommendation. How do we actually get consumer and energy policy to sync and work together so we move faster? And any other thoughts from your vantage point, looking globally, but of course, UNCTAD focusing in on the needs of low and middle income countries, first and foremost. Teresa, and Thank happy right. World Consumer Rights Day. <laughs> also, happy World Consumer Rights celebration. It's mostly a week or even a month of celebrations, as we know. Good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning to everybody. Thank you very much to Consumers International, and congratulations, Elena, to you and your team for uh, choosing such a timely topic, which I should say that, of course, we, are, we have been following this from the strict uh, consumer protection point of view, but because ANCTAD is also involved as the UN Conference on Trade and Development on the impact, of course, of um, global events uh, across the world, but mostly in the developing countries, which as Elena mentioned, are our focus. We have been following for a year now, the impact of the war in Ukraine, in food, in energy, and in finance for development. And I will put in the, the chat, a report that we did, with actually also some, has some, gather some suggestions of, of policy measures, especially of course, considering developing countries' needs. No, thank you also for mentioning, of course, that we are the custodian of the UN guidelines for consumer protection. I will just mention, I, I thought, I think that the previous speakers highlighted very important issues. I think that, as you rightly said, from ANCTAD's point of view, it's the needs of developing countries, and especially even the least developing countries, which are roughly 40 countries that concern us. And even though, of course, Oliver in the report, in the white paper mentioned very important issues, let me highlight two things. First, access, access uh, to essential goods and services as one of the consumer's legitimate needs, and concretely what the guidelines since they were revised in 2015 mentioned regarding universal access um, to clean energy and the importance of for all public utilities of for member states to ensure appropriate levels of service, quality and technology, appropriate regulatory oversight and the need for awareness raising programs and the importance of community participation. Of course, all of these aspects, one way or another have been touched upon by, by previous speakers. I think we are, um, from our point of view, concerned with two things. First, access, because as I mentioned, in a number of developing countries. Uh, it's not just tariffs, it's really access, so connection. So a lot of developing countries are not fully covered in terms of providing access to energy. And this leads to what we call the, pay, the, the poor pay syndrome, meaning that those who have no connection have to spend more money on energy, which is vital as has been pointed out for all our daily needs either as consumers or as entrepreneurs or as a um, uh, small uh, runner of uh, small businesses that is one thing the other thing is really the situation of vulnerable and disadvantaged consumers and i believe the white paper also mentioned that and oliver did mention this when he talked about um inclusivity and uh, the even the digital divide because nowadays even to find online um, more economic and more advantageous um, uh, solutions, one needs to know how to use digital tools and compare tariffs from, from different providers, et cetera. So we really have these two big concerns. I believe that they are have been addressed by the white paper. Sorry, I, did, I have not yet <laughs> been able to fully read it, but I focused on, on, on the recommendations. So this is something I wanted to mention. I also wanted to mention that, as, as others referred, that the United Nations framework um, for the climate change recognizes that consumers play a crucial role in increasing climate change actions. And we heard our youth representative and, of course, other consumer um, advocates talk about this. I think this is quite clear, but as Consumers International and other colleagues, we do believe that consumers are drivers for change. This means, of course, needing increased uh, awareness raising uh, information. As a previous uh, regulator myself, I have to say that I do believe that this type of complex services require 
support from regulatory bodies to consumers, even if there are, it is very important that there are tools that really explain to consumers the impact of their choice. And we heard about uh, electric vehicles, but of course, I think this, this applies to the choice of solar panels or other um, energy efficiency tools. Uh, so I think this is, uh, it is very important. Amongst the regulators that are mentioned, I wanted to make the case for competition uh, authorities, Elena, for obvious reasons. Also because last year we did release a report on access to by consumers to energy, water and sanitation. And we asked the competition authority of Austria to address the issues brought up in a EU, uh, I would say mature um, uh, market. Uh, from a competition point of view. So I, I, I want to say that we abs I absolutely agree, of course, who cannot with the recommendations. Let me get straight to the point. I do see a little bit of a challenge. I'm more familiar, for instance, with the EU setting and in a number of European um, uh, member states, the energy regulators have either a direct responsibility of promoting consumer protection in that in their portfolio, so energy and gas, for instance. And they usually have advisory bodies where they have representatives from the, the Director General of Consumer Affairs, but also of consumer associations, among several others, of course, representatives of the services providers and of big businesses, etc. I do think competition authorities have an important say because in a number of developing countries, the fact that these markets are still uh, very much dominated by either state-owned companies or by monopolies also do not allow consumers to get a fair deal. And in this transition, so privatization, deregulation, competition authorities can play a very important role and also make a very good case for a sustainable uh, energy transition. So this is the first thing I wanted to say. I also wanted to mention the, 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 the two other, briefly, the two other recommendations. I think it's very intelligent, if I may say so, to actually uh, dialogue with business models. I don't think in general that um, consumer organizations have necessarily um, that tradition, but, but it is clear from the UN guidelines for consumer protection that sustainable consumption, let me put it in, in these terms, is really something of shared responsibility between governments, between businesses, between civil society organizations and consumers. So this is, I think, really the right approach. And I think you make a very good case for that. And what else? I think also it's very intelligent to promote uh, the gathering of data um, and intelligence because only with evidence-based um, information one can suggest measures to governments, um, to business associations, and even to regulators. So I think, Elena, not to um, take too, too much more uh, time, I would stick uh, here. I'm happy to come back uh, when we have the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Really appreciate your, your commentary there and the partnership around uh, so many things, including World Consumer Rights Day. Rasmus, um, may I come to you next? Rasmus Abelgard Christensen is currently Vice President and of uh, Group Public Affairs at Danfoss, which is a global company that really is uh, driving energy efficiency uh, through a variety of products uh, that then come to consumers. Um, he has, again, as so many of uh, all of our panelists do, um, a fascinating background. Uh, Rasmus, you were a, a diplomat, you were an ambassador for Denmark to a variety of countries uh, from Indonesia uh, to even the whole of ASEAN uh, through in 2017 to 2020, I think. So you will be able to see both the geopolitics of this and uh, the importance of our second recommendation, which is around making sure that we support the very different types of business models that might be in play. Um, given your experience, I'd love your commentary on anything you've heard uh, at this point in the conversation. What might we have missed? Uh, where do you think we need to dial down a bit further? Um, and I'd love your thoughts on, well, how might we build up this recommendation number two in our white paper? And remember that we've got consumer organizations from around the world listening here. So what 
enables us to maintain our independence, push for consumer rights and help with these business models for the future. Rasmus. Thank you so much, uh, Helena, and thank you for the, um, for the invitation to, uh, to speak today. I really like the, the, the framing of the discussion, uh, having you know, the twin goals of, of both empowering and protecting consumers uh, in the, the clean energy transition. Um, I will actually start a little bit uh, at home, so to speak, in, in Denmark, uh, to spend a couple of seconds on, on, on the Danish experience. If you look back historically, I think a lot of people will, will recognize Denmark as being a, a green front runner, if you like. Uh, pioneering uh, technologies such as, as wind power. But I think what, what most people may not realize is that uh, how, let's say, uh, communities and consumers actually played um, an instrumental role in that. I think part of the reason or the success of the early Danish model was exactly the fact that we had community-owned wind farms, cooperatives that you know created a lot of legitimacy and empowerment uh, in relation to the green transition. And that really created the foundation for what happened later. And even today, you could say uh, our biggest investors in, uh, in, in clean technology are our pension funds, which again represent in a way all the, the consumers. So this is, has been really a part and parcel of the, of the Danish uh, transition uh, journey. Now, if you look forward, I think, uh, of course, the supply side, uh, as we've heard from, from other speakers today, has, uh, has a lot of opportunities for consumers to be empowered, distributed energy systems such as solar, PV, uh, et cetera. Uh, but of course, it's also uh, an area where things are, are getting more complex. If you talk about uh, offshore wind parks or power to X facilities, hydrogen, I mean, these are industrial size uh, in, in investments uh, that can be very difficult for the old experience from Denmark of, of sort of cooperatives to, to, to engage with and own. Uh, but of course, uh, there, are other, uh, there are other possibilities. But from my perspective, I would say that the, perhaps the demand side is actually what has the biggest potential for uh, consumer uh, empowerment. And uh, digitalization is, of course, a strong enabler of that trend. I'll come back to it. Electrification, another one uh, of the energy system, a key factor. And then finally, the fact that the energy system going forward will be based on fluctuating renewables, which requires uh, flexibility. But more importantly, we need uh, you know, modern technology and solutions. And in my view, perhaps change the discourse a little bit away, especially when we talk energy efficiency, away from behavioral change alone, meaning lower temperatures in the room wear a sweater, suffer. Uh, and also, it's not always about deep renovation of buildings, which I think you know, would place uh, you know, a costly burden on, on many consumers. But I would like to talk a little bit more about the opportunities for creating smart homes uh, where energy efficiency gains are actually more obtained through uh, digital uh, controls. Uh, one example, which of course is, is, uh, is at the heart of, of, of my company, is something like a thermostat. Uh, it may sound like a, you know, a, an, an obvious device, but I think most people would be surprised to hear that we still have 300 million radiators in Europe without a thermostat. Uh, and that can be then uh, installed either, uh, uh, you know, simple manual thermostats or more importantly today, electronic thermostats based on, you know, artificial intelligence, allowing consumers really savings up to 30 to 35 percent of their heating bills, uh, simply based on controlling things uh, and with very short uh, payback times. <clears throat> so that's that's one point. But perhaps. More important, I think this is where it gets really interesting and also more empowering for the consumers is really the rise of flexibility as a need in today's energy system. So electrification, of course, drives electricity consumption up and we get more fluctuating supply from renewables that needs where we need to manage peak loads. So consumers and households can play an incredibly important role in managing that by offering flexibility to the market. So when a consumer, a household charges the EV, uh, the electric vehicle, or it decides when to uh, tumble dry or wash clothes, uh, simply by shifting uh, the electricity demand in time, uh, it can have a huge beneficial effect on the electricity system. But more importantly, it's, an, it's, a, it's a service that you can sell back to uh, the systems operators or the grid. So basically a flexibility market. And there we are seeing right now a lot of new business, business models coming online, aggregators who basically aggregate the demand from a lot of household 
and offer it into the uh, to the utilities or the district uh, to, uh, the, the systems operators. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, consumers uh, will be empowered by and engages them. They are basically paid to shift their load uh, to another time uh, or decide, okay, I don't need to charge my, my electric vehicle uh, in, during peak hour, but I'll do it during the night or at some other time. And I think we will see a lot, uh, lot more of those mis business models uh, going forward. But of course, there are still some regulatory barriers uh, that needs to be uh, broken down. All this also comes with dilemmas. Uh, I think we're all aware of that. Um, one dilemma, at least, that we have noticed is uh, between, uh, let's say, data protection on the one hand and empowerment and impact uh, on the other. Because all these digital solutions that actually offer a lot of uh, potential for uh, harvesting energy savings, they often require both smart metering, flexible prices and sensors at home that allows you to share data between the consumers and the utilities or the DSOs. This is already reality in many countries like the UK, parts of the United States, in Denmark, but we have many other countries where this is considered either controversial among governments, but certainly also among consumers and where there would be requirements for, let's say, opt-in models where consumers would actually have to decide that, yes, I will allow my data to be shared um, for it to, to happen. Uh, of course, that's a good thing in, in many ways because it protects consumer rights, but we also need to balance it against the uh, opportunities here for energy savings that actually rely, uh, you know, requires the gathering of big data to function uh, properly. Transparency of business models is another issue. I think the high energy prices we experienced in Europe last year shed uh, a lot of light on some of these um, business practices. What does it mean when you have a fixed price? Are you better off with flexible prices? Can the consumers really understand what the difference is? Um, it's a little bit like interest rates, right? You, uh, you also need to understand that if you want to have a fixed rate, uh, it comes with a premium if you want the certainty. Uh, but there are a lot of advantages by having flexible prices that allows you to do things and, it, and it basically empowers you as a consumer. But we need more information about that. So in sum, I think from my perspective, we need to explain, discuss, and recalibrate these balances between consumer protection and empowerment in tomorrow's energy system. And of course, competition, as one of the previous speakers mentioned, is also key in that, uh, in that, uh, that picture. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to round us off, um, I'm going to call on Gray Lee. Gray is um, a, a sustainability and ESG uh, expert hailing from S&P. Now, many of you might know S&P, you may not necessarily know that it's connected to Sarah Week, which is one of the biggest energy conferences that happened last week in Houston. Um, and so, you know, in your expertise back from real estate and building, now advising corporations on sustainability and ESG, but also thinking about last week, what do you feel about how we raise visibility for consumer rights and the consumer in the energy transition. And what do you feel about the interventions and recommendations that we're making in this paper? Where do we go next? Gray. Thank you, Helena. And, and thank you all. This is wonderful to be part of this conversation. So many uh, important insights being shared this morning. Thank you all. I am at, uh, at Sustainable One, which is the umbrella organization within S&P, uh, the S&P Global organization, where we're focusing on these expanded corporate performance metrics, not just financial metrics. S&P Global is a financial services information provider. We've been doing this for 150 years. And just in the last decade, we've started to add in this ESG, the non-financial corporate performance data that we've been able to quantify and provide to our clients to, to generate new insight into corporate performance, mostly along the sustainability agenda, but also other aspects of uh, important stakeholder engagement around diversity and gender, gender equity and, and other aspects of corporate performance. It's exciting to think about where we can support the consumer in this journey towards sustainability. And the idea of having good data to under to to to, uh, to undergird decisions that are being made at the consumer level, we work mostly with intermediaries. Uh, we heard a little bit earlier about pension funds from Rasmus and and cooperatives. 
energy companies that support their communities more directly. We support those types of entities making decisions. And, and yet the consumer has a big part of this as a citizen. And consumers in their actions distribute, uh, their distributed decisions influence markets. S&P Global is a, a market supporting organization providing information to power markets of the future. When you think about how cons individual consumers are participating in this great transition, we have a lot to do as both consumers and citizens supporting policy that will frame the, the, the markets in which we operate or that we participate in as consumers. Considering what we went through with Sarah Week, with a big energy con uh, uh, gathering last week in Houston, we know that consumers will have more power in the energy markets of the future. And we know that technology is enabling more distributed uh, interaction with, with energy markets. So consumers' relative power is growing, and that is very exciting. That means that not only do we want to concern ourselves with con consumer rights, but also the, right, the responsibilities that consumers have in these decisions that they're making. Hopefully, S&P will be part of that journey to support uh, whether it's asset managers or other aggregators of consumer behavior, or even getting into specific support of consumer decisions, like we do in the automobile market. We heard from Dr. Warren, uh, sorry, from, from Dr. Warren earlier about EVs. And now we have, with our technology and, and data aggregation power at Carfax, the ability to provide insight to consumers on making those decisions about what do they need to meet their needs and support a sustainable future for our, for our planet and our, and our communities. So SMP is a part of uh, this, this information backbone for a lot of markets, but we're enabling more consumers to connect directly into that information through our ESG scores, through our, which are available on our website, and through other uh, access points, as an example, uh, Carfax with automobiles. So I look forward to supporting more of these activities going forward, and hopefully we can continue to collaborate. And, and I, I really do want to just make sure we, we definitely raise up the voice of youth. And Asma, thank you so much for sharing so much earlier about your work and what we can do as communities to support the next generations who, who will both have the tremendous responsibility of responding to the global problematic, but also the incredible opportunities of engaging with, with new uh, pathways for meeting uh, the, the, the ability of our communities to thrive in the future. So thank you very much, everyone. Okay, we are coming to uh, the last couple of minutes in our time together. So let's make most use of it. We've heard, and I would love to make sure consumer organizations know this as we undoubtedly do, consumers are key to the energy transition we've heard. Consumers will have more power in the energy transition and in the future, aggregated models. Sometimes consumer organizations are the ones who actually support that type of aggregated model um, and enable it to happen. I want to shout out to Consumentenbond for their work over many years uh, in the Netherlands on that front. Um, the variety of barriers that have been brought up uh, are crucial as Ollie laid out um, all the way from pre-purchase through to uh, support uh, in use. Um, we are having a couple of questions that are coming up about specific uh, situations. In India, um, the EU's reaction to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, we have answered one, uh, which is about how are we, or we're about to answer one, which is about how we look into access, that's actually going to be one of the, the discussions during the course of this week as well, actually at Consumers International. Maybe um, if, uh, let's see, open to the floor if any of the panelists would like to respond to the, any of those questions or respond to each other and the points that you've heard. Do you think we've made a compelling and coherent narrative at this point or what have we missed out? Teresa. Thank you very much. No, just very briefly, and sorry to, to uh, come back to this, but I would still focus on the recommendations. 
and this collaboration to align energy and consumer policy at national and international levels. I think, Elena, that even though, of course, I su we, we support this, we think it is very important that this is clear for governments, clearly addressed at governments and policymakers, because, because of the issues that I mentioned that are really uh, challenging developing countries. So the fact that access is still a problem, the fact that there are a number of um, um, well missed in existing connections across developing countries' territories, and the fact that several developing countries, even mid um, middle income one, uh, mi middle income ones, due to the crisis on food security financing for de for development, do not necessarily have the fiscal space needed to actually grant subsidies, which of course we have seen in a number of countries and several of the speakers mentioned. So this bringing this collaboration, which I think is really the way forward, needs to um, encompass, uh, well, support. So um, adaptation needs to be funded uh, because it won't, it won't be the developing countries themselves that can uh, be expected to pay for the energy transition in general, as they have made the point in the World Trade Organization discussions and elsewhere. But also uh, consumers need, their consumers, their citizens also need to be aware of this because as I said, civil society uh, uh, especially can be really a driver for change in, in making um, the, the government sure that this needs to be also um, agreed upon an international level. And that has been pretty much the position that ACTAD has supported so far. Thank you. Great point, thank you. And Rasmus, you have your hand up. No, just, a, just a quick comment on, on Teresa's uh, points uh, that are indeed very good. I, I fully agree with uh, the need to upscale also uh, international financing available to uh, developing countries to uh, both implement energy efficiency measures and uh, renewable energy. Um, on energy efficiency specifically, just, just one comment which relates to the fact that we also need to remember that many developing countries are still spending enormous amounts of money on fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, also directly to consumers, either for fuel or for electricity. Uh, and I think uh, some of the good practices that we've seen from, from some countries is how they have they are experimenting now with shifting those subsidies away from fossil fuels to basically subsidize, let's say, clean energy investments instead. So in that way, you incentivize, in fact, the consumer to, uh, to change, uh, especially for solutions with uh, short payback times, whether it's uh, solar panels or, or some of the uh, energy efficiency measures that, uh, that we have been, uh, been talking about. So I think that's, that's part of the, uh, the equation, too, that we need so to stop subsidizing the wrong things. And we see that in Europe, of course, as well, especially in the autumn with the, you know, the elevated prices where most governments did the exact opposite of what they should have done, which was to subsidize uh, consumers for their high energy bills instead of trying to subsidize the transition away from, from gas, for example. <clears throat> Quinta. Yes, very quickly. Um, I think my point is probably really similar to the last uh, two speakers. Um, just to reinforce that the solutions that we're talking about have to match the actual needs of the people that we're, we're trying to help. And so that means we have to come up with a plethora of solutions. I know I talked a lot about EVs, but even we recognize that they're not quite the right thing for everyone, even in America, even if you can say that we have access to electricity pretty much everywhere. Um, I do want to say, because I, I don't think we've actually called this out, but stakeholder engagement with consumers is important in order to find those solutions, right? We can't, we're, that's not solve a problem that they haven't um, identified that is a problem for them. So. I think they need to be a part of coming up with what the right solution is for them. And then, yes, at the end, we present them with all the options that are available to them and then let them make the decision that's uh, right for them. Excellent point. Thank you. And I think, Ollie, you've responded, I believe, on the points on access. But how do, how do we react to that in the paper? There's no one size fits all solution. Um, we look across uh, South Africa, Pakistan, uh, Rwanda and also the case study that we've already heard from the Amazon at different models. Um, these include microgrids, uh, they include 
pay as you go solar, which is something, uh, a really innovative financing mechanism that will be uh, diving into in depth in Thursday's session um, and how consumer protection can be built into that sort of solution and in different ways that uh, governments can provide support for these solutions. I think Therese has already mentioned an interesting you know, question about connection versus tariff subsidies and how to avoid the, the so-called poor pay more syndrome when it's so often those who have no access to electricity uh, that end up um, paying the biggest penalties. So those are the, some of the challenges that we try and uh, surface in the white paper and through those case studies. Thank you so much, Ollie. Any other reactions from panelists to what they've heard, things that they hope for from the rest of this week, or they would love to ask of consumer advocates who are listening all around the world? Brilliant. Thank you for that very wide reaching uh, conversation spanning the globe. Um, I wonder if we could flag um, how the rest of Co World Consumer Rights Day week uh, will play out, uh, because today is where we share with you uh, the in insights and white paper uh, that has been developed, laying out some thoughts for reflection and reaction. Uh, we don't stop here. We know that over the around the world, uh, consumer organizations and consumer policy experts are celebrating and raising awareness of consumer protection and awareness, in some cases for the entire month. So well done and fantastic. And we hope that you will share that with us because I believe we have about 50 examples that we are now putting up on a rather awesome map on our website. Um, so I do hope you will send us that information so that we can celebrate you. Consumers' international perspective, we are going to continue the conversation throughout the week with the goal of highlighting our amazing members uh, who will be speaking on each of these, of bringing you together, and of bringing you together with uh, wonderful leaders from different walks of life who are thinking about this and with whom we can work. Uh, tomorrow, we will be looking specifically at business models, so digging into that second recommendation. On Wednesday, uh, we will be exploring the consumer vision for clean and affordable energy. On Thursday, we'll be looking at grassroots solutions and leveraging the power of consumers. And Friday, we'll conclude by asking, is consumer policy fit for a clean energy future? So trying to dig in at least a little bit into the different facets of this extraordinarily interesting, extraordinarily important topic. So we very much hope we will see you there. Um, you can access the report. This is hot off the press uh, for you on this first day um, at the links in the chat. And you can access any of those discussions uh, during the week via links that the awesome Consumers International team uh, have also put into the chat. All that remains me to, for me to do is uh, first to send a sincere thanks to our panelists from around the world uh, who have joined us at all times of the day and night to share their experience, their perspective, and to join in this conversation about consumers in the energy transition and to spur uh, some thinking and make connections. And let me also thank Consumers International team. Uh, we have Ollie, Chloe, Grace, uh, Valeria and Charlotte, who have been uh, uh, driving the report, and of course, Peter driving the report and this uh, World Consumer Rights Day. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting folks there, but please uh, support and thank the uh, Consumers International team for bringing us all together. Um, an excellent rest of the day, rest of the week to you all, and stay safe, stay well. And let's join and be part of the energy transition we all need. Take care. Thank you.